good morning, Ron. On the platform. Yes, you're morning, on the Jenna. platform. How are you, Ron? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. How are you going? How are you, mate? <laughs> oh, you know what? I, you know, you know what it's like when you come out of an, elec- uh, an election campaign. It's um, but a, a bit of mm. down, and then you just sort of, you know, you got to rock and roll with life, haven't you? And just get on with it. Well, it's happened to me twice: 2008 and 2020, and and now all the people who um, told me who didn't vote me are now wishing. They'd vote it differently, but there you go. Yeah, yeah, I've had a fair <laughs> bit of that too. And it's just like, oh, I actually didn't get out and vote, but I, I would have right. supported oh, you and all God. of that sort of stuff. But to be oh, fair, I mean, in my yeah. case, I was like a distant fourth anyway, um, yeah. a, and that's yeah. okay. Um, there was a big cha- There was a big support for um, the reconstitution of the town hall into some sort of civic space. Um, yep. I, think, I think that's wrong. I think we needed to do something different, and that's it. Yeah. And I was ho- I, yeah. I held fast to that. So you know, life is what it is. Um, yeah. So you just yeah. move on. Yeah, no, absolutely. So yeah. how are you yeah. finding yeah. it in the hot seat back in, in the mayoralty in Carterton? Oh, well, we're, we're, you know, we're in the process of changing the garden. You know how it goes when uh, uh, when uh, at this point in time the CEs and the staff are running around and organising the induction programs and I've had you know, conversations with Greg, um, had a really good chat with Greg. Um, you know, the bottom line is Greg is a lovely guy and uh, he, uh, he, he you know, does what he believes is the best for the community and to the best of, you know, what he could do as a, as a first-time mayor and, and I take my hat off to anyone who steps up, as you know, uh, Tina, anybody who puts their hand up and steps forward for public service because you certainly don't do it for the money. Let's be clear <laughs> about that. <laughs> how much? How much money do you get? Oh, I, I think the well, when I was here last time it was fifty eight k. I've got to say it's a hundred now. So, oh, that's, that's not so bad. Sensible. No, it's not so bad. You know, mayor of Masterton is about one hundred and thirty or something like yeah, that. Yeah, as a uh, councillor, I was getting thirty six. I think, well, yes, which was this is what I think, and that's the crazy was, part. I couldn't do any other work basically. Uh, you know, that's the it, and people don't get it. Look, absolutely right, Tina. And, and I've seen my councillors in the past, and over the years, I've watched councillors work their backsides off, being on call twenty four seven. You know, being attacked on social media, being praised. You know, they tend to you, you'd attend the opening of an envelope if that's what the community wants you to do, and and your family gets dragged into it, and and everything, and. Um, but, you know, the remuneration for councillors is appallingly low. And then people wonder why good people, qualified people, don't step up to the plate, you know? Why yeah. would they? You I know? totally why agree. Would they? Yeah. yeah, it's just nonsense. And so we'll get... have to talk to the remuneration authority, won't we? And tell them, you know, maybe... The, maybe well, is that all moot? Pay... I mean, you're going to be facing changes to local government being signalled oh. by the government probably, at, I think, this end of this month? Well, look, I tell you what, Tina, it's an onslaught, isn't it? I mean, I'm looking at all the issues we're facing and we're going to have to take the new councillors through this. And But with, when you put together the three different aspects of the RMA reforms, when you put their three waters and now the environment policy statement that's coming out of regional government, which is attacking the water upper it's as gonna well. Make, it's going to make the water upper a carbon sink for Wellington. Oh, oh yeah, we're going to offset. Wellingtonians yeah. pollution. And so all those people who drive to Wellington, one person in each car, we're going to subsidise their greenhouse emissions by planting trees in the wider app before them. Oh, no. Go, uh, <laughs> go get a life. Get a life. I well, I hope this is the on one issue that motorway. unites the three mayors and three new mayors. Yeah. Uh, and, oh. to, um, uh, and I suspect you will lead the charge because you're the ex- most experienced one of the three in terms of uh, understanding what mayor does uh, yeah, a- and yeah. so you know the, the it rests on your shoulders Ron to make sure well, that I tell you what, we're not slapped again I'm going to work really closely with the president of fed farmers over here and we're going to have a concerted <laughs> attack you know do you know who that guy is Tina I wake up with him every morning <laughs> oh, oh don't tell me you're sleeping with the president of fed farmers oh Tina <laughs> that's a good yeah. man he's a good man <laughs> He is a good, he's a good man. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, I absolutely agree, and you know, I can't believe it. But this comes right back to a conversation we were having uh, during the amalgamation discussions way, way back. You know, was it 2013? So, do you favour amalgamating the three councils, or do you favour the unitary authority type model? Because I, I think I, I think I, councils up and down the country are going to be facing these questions. 
I think, you know, first, the first point is that if you're going to do something, do it properly, right? So unitary authority, you get rid of, you, you combine four councils down to one and uh, you have the same model that it's not new, it's not radical, it's the same model we have in Marlborough, Nelson, Tasman and Gisborne. And, and, if, and if those guys can run a unitary authority on their population base over their land mass with all the complications of transportation, uh, the, why can't we? You know, it's as simple as that. We argued it back then and they said, oh, no, it won't work because you don't have the population and rural New Zealand's dying, they're turning into zombie towns. Yeah, they're all invalid arguments said, now, aren't they? We, we said that was rubbish. Yeah. They said, oh, you're living in dreamland. And now look at it. So the populations yeah. here are exploding as people exit the cities to get away from city life. I mean, who wants to be ram raided? Nobody. Get out of Auckland, you know. And, I uh, am. I'm June you know, Marston and had its first one the other day. Yeah. You know, that right. was pretty and crazy. Well, and just, Imagine that. And we had a big, and we had a big arson attack uh, or whatever. Well, yeah, whatever I wanted that to talk was. to you about that. That's, um, that nah. seems a bit of a random thing and obviously quite seems personal random. based, not a gang yeah. thing or anything like that. No. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Whatever the whatever the situation behind that is, it's going to be complicated and probably not discussed a lot. Have but they managed on. to find the woman at the centre of it? Do you know? I don't, I don't know. I've, I haven't gone online looking. I spent all morning on the phone in Ukraine. Ah, um, that's the next <laughs> question I was going to ask you. <laughs> such is the life of poor Christine. She's got to live with me. Yeah, um, and she is a and, wonderful and woman. We, She's a bit like my bloke. You know, you've got you're, you're yeah. only really as good as your partner sometimes. And yeah. and if you don't have good partners' support, you. It's it's a it's a lonely game. So when you find the right um, one, and you've found the right one with yeah. Christine, and I have with David, life gets a lot yeah. more pleasurable. Ain't that the truth, you know? And if it, and there's there's they're coming right back, going to full circle on the conversation. See, Christine came out of Auckland, right? Uh, and she moved and she went down to Wellington. And then when we were talking about buying a home and and setting in a place, and I was sweating, and you know, I said, look. I've been thinking about it, babe, and, you know, if you want to buy a house up in Auckland, I could live at Beachlands, I could live at Drury, but I could not live in Auckland City itself. And she said, well, actually, I was thinking we should buy in Wairarapa. And I went, oh, my God, I don't believe she said that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we've been here since 2000. Well, I came, Carleton was where I was, when I, I you know, my parents were living when I was born. But yep. um, we came back here and bought our little place in, in Carleton. And, you know, and, she yep, and we're both lifestyle block warriors as well, yep, and with yep, the emphasis on yep. worrying rather than... <laughs> yep. and, just, and, her, and her first year, her first lambing season here, she was elbow deep. <laughs> yeah, and I've been out by D. Mind you, I come from a rural background, but our, our story was pretty much the same. You know, we met, met at work, yeah. and uh, we just he just said to me, "What do you want to do?" And I said, "Actually, I just want I want to go and live back in the country. I'm I'm over living in the big city." And he said, "Oh yeah. well, let's go and do that then." So that's what we did. Yep. And so uh, well, I never yeah. never look back. But lifestyle blocks are hard, and the turnover is yeah. is really high on them too. But oh. let's get back to the Ukraine because, by crikey, yeah, um, they're getting whacked again, and it's actually had yep. a very personal focus for me in the last twenty four hours. So I have a young oh, friend yeah. who um, is deciding that he's going to just go and do some stuff. So he signed up for some aid agencies in the uh, US aid agencies. Um, and oh, yeah. he is heading to uh, uh, Warsaw, then Moldova, and then I oh, think yeah. he's going to Jordan. Uh, so he's just he's just decided to do something completely different in his life. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah. So, what would your advice be to him as he hits the deck in Ukraine? Well, it, it does come down to the agency you're with, and you know, I've, I've I've told people not to bother with UN, not to bother. Well, I mean, Red Cross is Red Cross, and we don't. They do they do good work, but I I hear mixed messages because obviously Red Cross tries to remain apolitical and does work with Russia and does work with Ukraine, which offends people in Ru in Ukraine. Uh, so I, I tell people just avoid that. Um, but and and you. I, th I work with a faith-based organisation because I can trust and rely on the values and the principles against which they operate and the fact that uh, they they work through churches and they work through community leaders at that level means that the level of being involved in corrupt activity or being sideswiped by people who are, who are not exactly straight or honest uh, is absolutely minimised. So... 
Working with faith-based entity organisations is a very good step, I believe. Um, but there are uh, other agencies out there right now who are doing their own thing. Um, having an organisation such as one I'm with, which is 85% staffed by Ukrainians, um, and and we have we take advice and guidance from the Ukrainians. So, are you in contact? Are you in contact with them every day? Pretty much. And so what's I, the, what, I, how, I, how are they feeling after this last 48 hours? Well, I was just speaking to my friend Valerie, who's um, in the president's office, and uh, his, uh, he has a, a place in Kiev, and uh, one of those missiles landed uh, very close to his home. Unfortunately, at that time, there were university students going to classes, and a number of those students were hit. And, uh, and, you know, he says we've gone from having developed a degree of relative security, which I saw the last time I was in there in Kiev, uh, to being back to where they were the first time that I was in Kiev, where they were receiving rocket attacks and artillery attacks. Um, and it's, you know, so now that whole level of uncertainty is back with them again. No one feels safe, uh, and it's really is a lotto. Um, when the Russians are firing these dumb munitions and taking weapons that are designed for surface-to-air um, and using them uh, and as against ground targets, they are very indiscriminate. They are not precise, and they're pretty much landing anywhere, and nobody can guess it. I mean, the sooner they get uh, more sophisticated uh, uh, top cover from anti-air, uh, from uh, ground-to-air um, weapons provided by Europe, the better for them. But it is, it is like, a, you, if you can imagine walking out your door and not knowing whether or not you're going to get hit today, that's their life every minute of every day. Wow. And, and if you can imagine when you hear the fire siren go off, be it in Carterton from the fire station uh, or be it in Masterton, if you can imagine that that's going off three times a day and every time it goes off, it's a warning to you that there's possibility of a missile strike on you now. Yeah. And if you put yourself in that frame of mind, that's what they live with. That is an impossibility to understand, out. really, isn't it? We just don't. We we, we just we, no. none of us, unless you've actually well, been you put, in, in the war corridors. I mean, no one actually understands how bad that can be. No, that's right. Yeah, and you see your child off at the at the gate on their bicycle, and they're going to bike to school. But you're thinking, well, they could get hit by a missile on the way. So, how long do you reckon the war's going to last? I, I mean, is it, we're starting to see some some uh, uh, erosion around Putin's power and he's getting he seems to be more increasingly mad by the day so just exactly yeah. you know are, are we likely to see a, a conclusion of this over the next few months or well, do you, are you looking, think, thinking years no. well i think you know winter's gonna winter's gonna stall things down and that's why i think ukraine is is so determined to gain as much as they can before winter sets in proper and um and it becomes all you know, becomes very difficult but you know Ukraine's fighting a home game. You know, this is a, they're playing a home game here. Logistics lines, supply systems, so long as the West continues to support them, are very tight, very secure, very able, very capable and very reliable, uh, unlike the Russian logistic lines. So I'm, you know, my, my feeling is that um, in terms of the ground war, Russia will be rolled up a hell of a lot quicker than anybody's imagining. They will starve them out. They will deny them fuel. They'll deny them ammunition. They'll deny them the freedom to move. And you'll start seeing Russians surrendering in, in large numbers. But that'll still take months. And, and, you know, and the end goal is get uh, Crimea back, get Mariupol back, drive Russia completely out of Ukraine. Right, yeah. But here's yep. the question. Whether the game ends or not there is entirely dependent on whether Putin is still in power and whether the Russian population really who are still psychologically and philo philosophically enslaved into this regime Well when they run for the borders the when they think they're going to be conscripted you'd say that his, his support <laughs> base is starting to get eroded I don't blame but them you been, know. No but he's been prop, <laughs> propped up by oligarchs and he's been propped yes. up by generals who've got nowhere to go and, and who quite frankly know that they're probably going to end up in front of a, a, a war crimes tribunal answering for what they've done. Yep. So, you know, yeah, the question is, will they sacrifice Putin to save themselves? 
Uh, when will that happen? Will Putin continue to attack Ukrainian positions with indirect capabilities uh, even after they are expelled and they have lost the war in Ukraine? And what will Ukraine's answer to that have to be? And I'm, I'm, I'm looking to see more and more special force operations going on and those will, those, those will be exported uh, into Russia to make Russia realise that they need to withdraw completely. Yeah, and I really then, understand that. You know, hey, yeah. look, Ron, um, yeah. that's been a really enlightening um, uh, topic. Uh, no doubt you've also seen that we've got some issues, um, or the farmers are, are, pr are pretty annoyed, right, at the moment. I suspect you've had the odd yeah. call from the odd farmer saying what happened yesterday was a real smack in the teeth for them, uh, and, and yep. they're really concerned about how that's going to roll, roll out. Uh, and, and of course, you know, yeah. it's, uh, it is going to be interesting to see just uh, what, wh whether the government will pull back on this and whether they'll pull yeah. back on things like Three Waters too. And I heard a couple no. of things in the last couple of days it looks like Three Waters might get pulled back a bit. What's your view well, on I that? Think, yeah. Well, I think you know, the, 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 the biggest pullback that's going to have to occur is a pullback on the government. <laughs> and I said, you know, the, you cannot trust people, you know, and, and I need some clarity out of Chris Luxon and I'll ask for an appointment with him. I need some clarity as to exactly what he's going to do when, the, if, if and when they win the election, because what we need is the three waters in the rubbish bin. What we need is the ETS, uh, whatever they've announced to, uh, yesterday, to be wound back and killed. And what we need is uh, regional councils to be pulled into line as well, because we've got a lot of zealots inside of their administrations uh, inflicting stuff. I mean, first you had the one plan at Horizons. Now we've got the new environment policy statement coming out of Greater Wellington Regional Council. You know, it's like I said right at the start, if you put this emissions trading uh, decision, scheme decision, on the table, you put the uh, three waters, you put the RMA reforms, you put the emissions policy, uh, the environmental policy of RMA Rome, changes, RMA changes. You put all those there. Farmers are are being bombarded, and and you know this is like an attack from Putin on the rural community, <laughs> and uh, and it, you know it's it's great in a socialist circle if you're addressing uh, an international youth socialist movement. This sort of ideology is wonderful, but I'm sorry, you're in the big world, and the economy will choke. And all the wonderful things you want to do in saving world, world, you know, fixing world poverty and child poverty and that will go down the gurgler because you won't be able to finance it. Totally you know? agree, and Ron. Hey, look, Ron, thank you very, very much for your enlightening discussion this morning. Um, and we'll keep a watch on what's happening with the, with the U, with Ukraine, Ukrainian situation and also uh, the issues that I think are, are creating some interesting dynamics between country and the cities around Three Waters and all of the RMA changes where it just does feel that uh, the rural sector is doing the heavy lifting for towns. So yeah, we'll see absolutely. how that rolls out. And um, thank you very much for your time and you have a good day. Absolute pleasure, Tina, and we'll have to catch up for a while, eh? Absolutely. Okay, righty. I'm Tina Nixon. I'm standing in for Michael Laws uh, on the platform 0800 332283. Interesting hearing Ron talking about what's happening in the Ukraine uh, and how it's starting to fire up again. And just imagine living your daily life just no, not knowing whether you're going to survive to the basically to get home for tea. It'd have to be pretty pretty tough. Uh, and also this, the, the continual erosion of the way of living for our rural community, not just farmers, because if it affects farmers, it affects the rural community. And, and what impact that's also going to have on towns as well.